Hi, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Li Wei Chen from Suzhou Institute of Nanotech and Nanobionics, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Um, I'm recording from my office in Suzhou. Uh, this is a special occasion for me because I hosted uh, the GOPV conference in 2012. And uh, time flies, it's uh, already uh, four years now. Um, so it's a great opportunity for me to present uh, and share with you all of our uh, developments in the last four years. Uh, my group in Suzhou, uh, generally speaking, we are interested in energy nanotechnology. Uh, so we make nano building blocks uh, such as nanoparticles, nanowires, nanotubes, and we make functional composites and then uh, make these materials into uh, devices. The two uh, major types of devices we are interested in are uh, solar energy conversion, um, that is to say uh, PV devices, and the second one uh, is electrochemical energy storage, uh, batteries and um, supercapacitors. Um, but uh, for both of these uh, um, devices, the performance is not only determined uh, by the materials themselves, but also uh, the interfaces in between different materials. So uh, in um, my group, we are uh, interested in using the um, atomic force microscopy, uh, this characterization tool to um, look at interfaces and try to understand uh, more detailed uh, mechanisms. Um, so for today's talk, um, of course, I will focus on solar energy conversion. Um, here, there's a fundamental question um, that we need to consider because uh, uh, usually atomic force microscopy, um, everybody use that for uh, looking at the morphology. Um, but the function of photovoltaic devices uh, actually originates from the motion of charge carriers, electrons and holes. So uh, essentially, when we use AFM to study the device mechanism, uh, we really need to uh, use functional imaging modes to characterize the motion of charge carriers. And um, on top of that, uh, uh, we should then study the physical and chemical factors uh, affects the device performance or affects the motion of charge carriers. Okay, um, so uh, um, in today's talk, I will uh, basically cover um, two um, discussions. One is uh, energy level alignment uh, in operando devices. And uh, we will uh, quickly get into um, that detail and, and see it is very important to uh, have an uh, operando um, that is uh, working devices per se. And the second uh, issue we will discuss would be uh, high efficiency large area devices, uh, uh, flexible OPV. So we start with the first one, uh, energy level alignment. Uh, when I first uh, uh, get into the OPV field, um, it was through a collaboration with uh, Professor Hong Bing Wu at uh, South China University of Technology. Professor Wu's lab um, has been uh, extremely uh, good and successful at organic electronics, uh, such as organic uh, LED and OPV. And um, back in 2011, uh, they came up with a, a very good uh, new device uh, structure where they use a polymer called PFN. Oh, excuse me. Polymer PFN um, use it as a cathode interlayer to modify the device structure. And they were able to uh, they were able to obtain um, the device conversion efficiency of 8.37%. That was the highest uh, uh, among uh, all uh, reported results back then. And um, more importantly, the, the, the uh, result of the PFN interlayer is that it improves the open, cell, uh, open circuit voltage, short circuit um, current density, and fill factor, the three factors uh, are improved all simultaneously. So that is a really significant uh, result. And the question was, uh, what is the mechanism? How does PFN interlayer improve uh, the performance? So um, we use this uh, uh, functional imaging mode uh, called scanning Kelvin probe microscopy, which uh, is capable of map uh, the surface potential locally with the sort of nanometer uh, scaled resolution. 
So uh, looking at a, um, uh, a, a model the device where we have half of the area um, covered with the PFN interlayer and the other half is uh, active layer, exposed active layer. And we look at the surface potential map um, with only five nanometer thick interlayer, uh, we actually observe a 300 millivolts potential difference. All right, so that means um, locally at this uh, PFM interlayer, the local, uh, the local electrical field is um, higher than the built-in field of the device. And, that's, uh, and the direction of that field is aligned with the built-in field. So uh, the, the effect of that built-in field is that it will um, um, promote the carrier separation, um, prevents uh, uh, recombination, and uh, uh, help the transport. So that improves the JSC and the fill factor. And also the interface dipole uh, raised the overall um, uh, built-in voltage. So that would allow for higher VOC. So this was our understanding um, uh, back then. And we were very uh, happy with the results. Um, but um, you know, looking at this energy diagram that uh, shown here to, to help our understanding, we are not exactly satisfied because these straight lines you, you see drawn on the energy diagram, we really do not know whether they are correct or not, right? Should they be straight lines or should they curve upwards or should they curve downwards? Is there, um, you know, how high would the interface dipole be? We, we really had no idea. So uh, we set out to look into this uh, uh, um, problem. So um, that is, uh, we call it energy level alignment challenge. This is actually um, a problem in the field for quite a long time. Each individual material that we use to build this device, we can measure uh, their work function, we can measure their energy levels using cyclovoltammetry, using um, um, UV uh, photoelectron uh, spectroscopy. And, but as soon as we um, put them together to make the device, we do not know whether these uh, Fermi levels are exactly aligned and or you know, in the case of um, insulating or semi semiconducting material, should the vacuum level be aligned and whether or not there be electron transfer or charge transfer um, across interfaces, we do not know. And even with the theoretical um, calculation, the system would be too complicated to calculate and we do not know uh, what's the energy level alignment. So um, the idea, uh, but, but the problem itself is actually extremely important. So this is a, again, a simplified straight line um, um, assumption or straight line approximation. You know, even just this quantity, the, the difference between the two sides, that is the building potential. Uh, you see a classic Onsager model um, um, predicts, you know, the uh, probability of exciton dissociation is extremely uh, dependent on this uh, built-in field. Right? So um, again, in the field, um, there have been a few techniques um, can measure the building potential, but these are indirect methods such as electroabsorption spectroscopy and mott schottky analysis. And oftentimes they are not uh, quantitatively correct. Uh, and so we, we think we wanted to um, uh, study this uh, problem. So again, back to this energy diagram, this is a outstanding uh, challenge here. And can we just directly look at this energy diagram in, in experiments? So we proposed, we, we thought this idea, can we just make a cross section? Then we are basically essentially looking at this energy diagram, but not, you know, in a theoretical or hypo hypothetical sense, rather, you know, in experimental detail. So all we need is to cut the cross section and make sure that we can image it while the device is still operating, the device is still uh, alive. And, and then we can use the scanning Kelvin probe, the same exact uh, uh, principle as we shown earlier in the collaboration with Professor Hongbing Wu's group. So uh, indeed, um, we 
were able to uh, prepare such a nice and smooth uh, cross-section using iron beam, um, um, iron beam milling uh, technique. And you see shown here the IV curve before and after the cross-section. Uh, so the conversion efficiency of this P3HT PCBM device uh, was uh, preserved at 3.17% even after this uh, cutting of the cross section. And, and you see these are this, the, the lower left frame was the uh, SEM image of the cross section. Uh, it's pretty smooth. And um, are the AFM topography and AFM face image and you see especially at the AFM face image the interfaces between different layers are quite clear um, that allow us to um, uh, uh, locate where the interfaces are. Okay so now we have this uh, uh, operando device uh, with exposed cross-section we can actually use a scanning Kelvin probe microscopy to look at the energy Basically, it's the uh, uh, surface potential mapping, and if you multiply it, multiply the surface potential with the absolute charge of electron, then you get the vacuum level. So essentially, we can map the vacuum level position across the thickness of the device while the device is in operation. Right, so uh, uh, now we can. Um, measure it under all different conditions in dark under illumination uh, uh, forward bias and backward uh, reverse bias and open circuit or short circuit um, the device would be you know be working and tell us uh, what what the vacuum level alignment is and so now again when we go back to this question now we have the measurement right so the previous images are typical images and we if we take profiles across the device then we get uh, data like uh, what's shown here on the uh, right side and you see the dark line uh, is on the surface potential profile um, in dark and this is uh, the, the, the open, the open uh, square would be the uh, profile in, uh, under illumination. So you see the, the, the profile is raised up because that's a uh, open circuit voltage under illumination. And uh, uh, if we multiply this line with the minus Q, uh, then we would obtain the vacuum level alignment. And that's what we see here. Um, the vacuum level position um, of this. So now in this diagram, it's no longer our hypothesis or our guess. It, it, it has some basis of our experimental measurements. And I will uh, get, come back to this, why the shape of this vacuum level isn't exactly the same as, uh, as this measured line. We will come back to this in a second. And then uh, with illumination, then the uh, 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 one side would be uh, raised, the quasi Fermi level will separate, and then you get the VOC. Okay, so so qualitatively, all these uh, uh, observations sort of agrees very well with uh, what we see in the IV curve. Uh, for example, there's a built-in field, or the potential drop is continuous across the active layer. That means there's a built-in field um, uh, across the entire device, and that's beneficial for charge separation and uh, can help to suppress uh, charge recombination. So that's, you know, essentially how a P3HT PCBM device operates. Now, um, we mentioned that we are interested in this quantitative measurement of uh, device property here. So we look at this uh, measurements and we see the rays of the potential profile from the look at the uh, left side is supposed to be uh, VOC, right? We know that VOC is of this device is about 0.6 volts. And the difference between the anode and cathode should be the difference in their uh, work function. And that should be somewhere between 1.5 and 1.3 volts, depending on which uh, measurements you believe in the um, data uh, in the literature. But what we measure here, um, essentially, if you read from this uh, uh, data, it's only 0.2 and 0.5 volts, uh, uh, respectively, right? And so why are the measured values so much smaller than what we might expect? 
So we figured um, for a long time we didn't know why but then at the end we figured it's probably due to the tip cantilever induced averaging effect. Essentially the, the device here is very very thin. The thickness is only about 200 nanometer and we have an AFM tip that is about 20 nanometers in um, uh, tip radius and for the SKPM measurement we need to raise the tip for about 10 nanometer, 10 nanometer. So essentially we are looking at an area of about 50 to 60 nanometers uh, 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 wide, right? So when you image through the active layer, we are essentially averaging over it. So in the scanning probe microscopy field, this effect is uh, well known and called the convolution effect. Essentially the true potential, um, the true surface potential profile is convoluted by um, the tip transfer function and then you get a smoothed and averaged uh, measurements and that's what we um, uh, get, uh, that's what we saw. So we tried to verify this and we put bias uh, voltage in between the two electrodes. So if you have positive one volt bias then the ITO side should be raised by one volt. And if you put minus one volt, the ITO size should be uh, lowered by uh, one volt. But uh, what we exactly uh, what we um, uh, uh, saw in the experiment is not exactly one volt. Uh, essentially, we got a very uh, straight, uh, well correlated linear line, but the slope is not one; it's 0.4. So that indicates there's a systematic. Uh, systematic uh, 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 distortion here and um, our, our hope is then to um, uh, get the real measurements rather than you know having to using the 0.4 coefficient to, to, to back out the real um, number. So uh, luckily we observed a uh, quantitative correlation between the IV IV curve measurements and our measurement. That is explained um, here in this slide. So uh, in the previous slide we um, compared different, uh, different potential profiles under different um, uh, bias voltage. So if we take the profile with po positive 0.6 volts bias and try to compare it with the uh, open circuit but under illumination, the profile under that condition, you see the two lines essentially overlap with each other very nicely. And so with the um, theory of convolution, basically if these two convoluted measurements are superimposed on top of each other, that means, that means if you deconvolute that, so the true potential profile of the two cases are also overlapping. Otherwise, you, you know, you, you'll be smoothed uh, over and um, but the, they will still be different, right? So the, um, then you basically it means that uh, we use the, this uh, cross-section SKPM measurement to look at uh, VOC and that's 0.6 volts. And that is agreement with the IV, IV uh, curve measurements. So even though our measurement is very complicated and you know, it's, a, it's a very good sign that we do get the uh, same VOC uh, as the IV curve measurements. So, so that means there's a quantitative correlation between our measurements and uh, IV curve. So we can use this as a starting point and then we keep looking at say different potential uh, bias, 0 0.8 uh, bias, 0 0.8 volt bias, you see the uh, 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 surface potential profile is now flat over the active layer. There's a surface potential uh, uh, step at the uh, anodic interface. And if we raise it to 1.0 volts, it's inverted here. And at 1.3 volts bias, the two electrodes are now leveled together. Right. So what do these data mean? Essentially, for example, the 0.8 volts, if this is flat at a convoluted measurements, that means if you deconvolute it, it's also flat in the original or the real uh, profile. And that means our flat band condition is 0.8 volts, or that means the band bending is 0.8 volts. In this case, we can 
we can say it's the, the band bending or the flat band condition is essentially the built in potential. So this built in potential is 0.8 volts, which is greater than the 0.6 volts uh, uh, open circuit voltage, VOC. So it, it's kind of making sense, right? And the VOC should be less than VBI. So um, this is uh, our um, first measurement of the VBI in this uh, uh, system. And the 1.3 mo volts here means the, um, the, the vacuum level of the two electrodes is now leveled. So the bias voltage between the two means it's uh, the work function difference uh, within this operating device uh, is 1.3 volts. Right? So these kind of, so we can use the external bias as a compensating factor to, to see what are the energy level difference in an operating device. So we give this a, a, a name called bias compensation. Right. If you are familiar with the concept of scanning Kelvin probe, this actually is very similar to, to how the Kelvin probe works. So we can use bias compensation method to uh, eliminate the tip averaging effect in the sense that at least we can measure the difference between um, a few points, even though the entire profile itself is, is not quantitatively correct. Okay, so uh, uh, with this technique, we can actually do um, a few investigations into the factors uh, which affects the performance of the device. For example, the device, uh, the materials. Uh, we compared the two devices um, with two different uh, acceptor materials. So the PCBM is the classic uh, electron acceptor in the bulk header junction uh, system. And the ICBA is a new acceptor um, from the IV curve. Uh, from the IV curve, we can see that the VOC of the ICBA device is about uh, 0.2 volts greater than the uh, PCBM device, which is a, a very significant increase uh, in VOC and therefore a very uh, important uh, improvement in device performance. And we see indeed that the VOC or the rays of the surface potential profile under light is much more significant in ICBA device compared to PCBM device. Yeah, it's, it's important to notice that the dark, the profiles in dark are essentially the same for these two devices. Right. And we compare the flat band condition. Uh, we, we said that in PCBM device we studied before, the flat band condition is 0.8 volts. That is to say the uh, built-in potential is 0.8. Now for ICBA device, the built-in potential is 1.0, uh, so it's, it's 1 volt. But interestingly, um, the, if we compare what condition uh, is required to level the two electrodes, it's the same for these two devices, 1.3. Uh, it makes sense because we use the same metal, um, the same device structure. The only difference is the uh, electron acceptors. All right, so uh, uh, here we can now understand uh, why the ICBA device has a higher um, VOC. That's because the built-in potential here is greater. Right, the built-in potential is one volt here. And um, the next question, why the built-in potential is greater, that's because uh, the uh, interface dipole here uh, is uh, smaller because the sum of the interface dipole plus the band bending um, here would be the uh, work function difference between the two metals. So um, this is how we understand um, the mechanism of ICBA. And another, exper uh, another uh, uh, experiment to do is to look at different uh, device structures. So we studied the bulk hetero junction structure device versus planar junction device. You see the planar junction device made from the same material, P3HT and PCBM. Um, the, uh, the IV curve here looks very similar to the previous, the, the bulk hydro junction. But only thing to notice here is the current density is almost you know, one tenth of um, the current density of the bulk hydro junction device. So the fill factor and the VOC are essentially the same. So the um, uh, conversion efficiency is 10 times worse. Right, so we look at the surface, surface, surface potential of the planar junction device, and then compared with the bulk header junction device, you see immediately the difference is very obvious. So for the bulk header junction device, the built-in field is 
uh, there is a built-in field across the entire device. Um, but for the planar junction, the uh, built-in field is only there uh, at the interface between the PCBM and P3HT. That is to say, if the light is absorbed in the PCBM layer or in the P3HT layer, as long as the exciton cannot diffuse it to the interface, then the exciton will not see any electric field. So the exciton will not be separated and that's why the uh, JSC is so small. Right, so we can also help to understand the mechanism there. Uh, so we are, we are currently um, still uh, uh, working on other devices, uh, other device structures such as inverted device and uh, with different materials and so on. So we are uh, using this technique to study uh, uh, different uh, devices with different materials and different structures and hopefully we will uh, get to report that uh, really uh, soon. Okay. Okay, so the um, second um, uh, issue that we are interested and we would like to discuss is a high efficiency, large area flexible um, OPV. And um, in the, the motivation for this is that we observe or we, we, we find in the literature, you see that this, uh, this uh, figure is actually a compilation of data from uh, reported literature. Uh, each data point is a device reported in a paper. We plot the efficiency against the cell size. And you see for all these very high efficiency uh, device, uh, these numbers are obtained from small area device, typically on the, um, about 0.1 centimeter square. And um, as soon as the device area goes um, beyond one centimeter square, the efficiency comes down to about two to three percent and for even larger devices um, the de efficiency can quickly you know degrade down to less than one percent even right, so uh, we, we, we will be we are very interested in understanding why uh, this is the case and how can we make better uh, large area devices so as a quick summary here there's a two data points uh, the blue one is uh, what we make here using P3HT uh, material uh, greater than 3% um, and the red one is a PTB7 uh, material, the efficiency is uh, about 5.8. So we will show the uh, results real quick. Okay, the devices are made from a particular uh, uh, hybrid electrode uh, based on silver grid. So this is in collaboration with Professor Zhen Chui's group in our institute. Professor Choi is an expert in printed electronics. So his group is specialized in producing these uh, uh, transparent and flexible uh, thin film without ITO. The basic concept is to use a honeycomb structured pattern of silver grid um, and they can be uh, electron collectors. And so we uh, obtain these silver grid electrodes from Professor Choi's group and modify them uh, with the uh, conducting organic material. So eventually we got um, hybrid electrodes with a sheet resistance of less than uh, 2 ohm per square. So that is one order of magnitude uh, uh, smaller than commercial ITO on glass. So uh, uh, this is very important for uh, our device. So with a typical uh, inverted structure uh, stacking we uh, get this is the IV measurements for P3HT and PTB7 uh, devices and this is the EQE measurements and so uh, this uh, performance was uh, actually was the best uh, in 2014 for a large area that means a greater than one centimeter square device uh, but in 2015 I think um, Professor Hongzhen Chen's group and other groups also came up with a much better device. Um, I, uh, so these are great work and great progresses. Um, so uh, our work back then, uh, we not only reported these uh, number, but we also tried to understand why uh, these uh, hybrid electrodes were good for large area devices. So in order to understand this question, why these uh, electrodes were good, we prepared and compared two series of devices. 
One is um, using these uh, special um, hybrid electrodes, and the other would be using the glass uh, ITO on glass. For each series of device, we make three uh, different active area, uh, three different sizes of uh, active area. One is uh, 1.0 centimeter square, the other is 0.3, uh, the other is 0.1 centimeter square. And you see, for the uh, silver grid based uh, hybrid electrodes, the IV curves of the three different devices with different active areas uh, essentially overlap with each other. They are not so much difference. But for, IT, for the ITO on glass uh, electrode, the smallest device um, has the highest uh, current density, and as soon as the area goes, great, uh, goes larger, then the uh, current density becomes smaller and smaller. Right? So uh, we fit each of these IV curves with the standard um, uh, diode model, and we got the um, serious, res uh, the, the, uh, serious resistance, and we see the uh, serious resistance is uh, for both series. These are linearly um, uh, correlated with the device area. Um, but the difference is in the slope. Right? So for the ITO on glass uh, device, the slope is uh, uh, fairly steep. So the, the, the series resistance is very dependent on the area. But um, the, for the hybrid um, silver, silver grid based hybrid electrode, it's rather flat. So the series resistance is not so dependent on the area. It does, it, it does linearly scale, but the correlation is um, not so significant. Right, so we noticed that this um, linear correlation, the slope of which is essentially the sheet resistance of the current collecting electrode. So that's why, th so now we understand why that's because the we have a sheet, uh, the sheet resistance of the hybrid electrode so much smaller than ITO, that means you know, it's much better in current collecting efficiency, and that's why uh, this uh, type of hybrid electrodes are um, very good for, um, especially the OPV system, because the mobility of charge carriers is not as, as great as uh, for uh, silicon, for example. Okay, uh, just to uh, summarize, uh, essentially I talk about two things. Uh, the first is the energy level alignment. Uh, we use a scanning Kelvin probe microscopy technique to look at a very smooth uh, device cross-section. Uh, here the important point is that the device need to be still operating um, when we cut the cross-section and when we do the measurements. Okay, If the device is no longer operating, then what we observe and probably have no uh, correlation with the IV curve and you know, have no correlation with the operating mechanism. Now, the second is uh, for large area flexible OPV, and we, uh, we use a special um, uh, flexible uh, transparent and conducting electrode uh, without ITO, and that particular um, electrode system is very good for large area device and we, we also try to understand why that's the case and uh, so th that's it. So at the end I would like to thank my group. Um, our group is called Opto Electronic Interface Lab. We have a logo here, OIL represents our interest in energy and this is the sun shedding on um, light on the hydro junction promoting one electron to across, excited across an interface to <laughs> other material. So uh, uh, the work done, uh, I've shown here, are mainly done by two um, uh, postdocs. Uh, uh, actually, uh, Dr. Chi Chen was my PhD student, and um, Dr. Yao Wen Li is now a uh, associate professor in Suzhou University, uh, along with two master students, Ling Mao and Yan Li. I thank my collaborators, Professor Hong Bing Wu at Su uh, South China University of Technology and Professor Bing Wang at USTC, and uh, uh, Yi Zhen Jing at Zhejiang University, and Yao Wenli at Suzhou University. And thank you for attention. <laughs>